Good morning, Brother Chad Long here from Delhi Baptist Church, and you have to forgive me, my mouth is dry. This is a yuhu. Um, hold on. Um, <coughs> yuhus are okay, but this brings to mind something we had when I was a kid. That we no longer have. Does anybody remember chocolate soldiers? I, I don't know if they had them in the area where we live now down in uh, south central Texas. But in northeast Texas where I was raised, we had a drink called the chocolate soldier. That was way better than Yuhu, And I don't know whatever happened to it. I, I sure wish I could find one. Anyway, <laughs> good morning. Well, we're in Hebrews chapter 7 now. And... Uh, I thought of one more thing relating to chapter 6 that just, uh, I, we're not going to go backwards. I just wanted to throw this out there. I was thinking last night about the difference between uh, Lot, Abraham's nephew living in uh, Sodom, and uh, Judas, Judas Iscariot. It occurs to me that if you were looking at either of these men, you wouldn't know if they were saved or not. So regarding Hebrews 6, where in the early parts of the chapter it, 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 it talks about the things it talks about that make you wonder about losing your salvation, and then in the latter part of the chapter where it's very clear God made a promise and keeps it. And, you know, I, I, the, the more I think about it, <clears throat> even after having read it and studied it and presented it, the more I think about it, the more I consider these two men. If you were to look at Judas and Lot, you, as a human, might assume Judas was saved. He seemed to be a partaker of everything the disciples did. He walked with them. He ate with them. He, uh, he just from an outsider looking in, he did all the same things they did. He appeared to fit. Um, again, I don't want to go backwards, but in that passage, it said something about being partaker of the heavenly gift and, and, uh, being enlightened and, and having all these things revealed to him, um, I would I would have looked at Judas and I would have assumed he was a believer, he was saved, and therefore could not lose his salvation. And uh, by the same token, I would have looked at Lot, and I would have thought, man, ain't no way Lot saved, <laughs> living in Sodom, right in the midst of the <coughs> most evil city of that day. I mean, I have been guilty of saying that it would be difficult to live in L.A. or or, uh, or Portland or you know some of these places where things are just really out of hand. It would be difficult to live there and be a true Christian. But remember that God looks on the heart. He doesn't look with our eyes. He looks with His. And He knows what He's looking for. And so... It could be argued that that whole passage just meant that um, yeah, the, the warnings that you have from Hebrews uh, 2 on, I mean, there's warning after warning. The warnings could just be about making sure you mean it and that it's real. I have I've to even told my children, just because you made a profession of faith in front of me, doesn't mean anything if you didn't mean it to God when you did it. And I saw all of my children make a profession of faith and get baptized. I'd like to believe every one of them are saved except for the baby, um, which is understandable because he can't even talk. But only they and God know. And it worries me in our church too. There's, there's a couple of people that I love dearly, who I, I, I really want to believe are saved. I don't know. Um, well, really, I don't know about any of them. <laughs> the only one I'm real sure about is me. <clears throat> so I guess the uh, the warnings and the text being as difficult as it was, is just a reminder that God looks on the heart, and you have to truly know Him. I do believe, and you will not convince me otherwise, that if you truly know the Lord... That you, and you, you're, there's nothing you can do to lose that. I do believe that. But I know that um, there's those who don't believe that, and I wish that they could understand 
that if you have the Lord, you have him. First uh, John 1, I think around verse 12, says, He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. So anyway, pretty simple stuff. But I didn't mean to spend five minutes on chapter 6. We finished chapter 6. We're in chapter 7, verse 1, which says, for this Melchizedek, remember at the end of verse 20 and several other places, it said that Jesus is a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, the order of Melchizedek is not that complicated. People want to make it complicated, and it's not. Um, I believe Melchizedek was a real person. I believe that he was a type of Christ and a picture of Christ. Some people think that he was a uh, pre-incarnate Christ, but... I don't because of some things that Abraham said or some things that are said about him. I, I think he was a real king. But order of Melchizedek is pretty clear because when you look at this man in Genesis, the Bible says he was a king priest or a priest king. He was both. He was a king and he was a priest of the Most High God. And this was before there was ever a... Uh, a Levite to tell them how to do it. Okay, there was this was before there was a, a Levi or an Aaron or a Zadok. So um, that we can cover those particulars another time. But what I want you to understand is in Canaan at that time, there was a city called Salem, probably in the same area that Jerusalem is later. And this king was also their priest. And while he claims, and I believe he did, because Abraham gave him tithes, he, he claims he believed in the one true God, and he was the the the, the king as far as uh, secular things and the priest as far as spiritual things. He led people to serve God as a king and as a priest. That's the way I understand that passage. We'll look at it in a minute. But when it says that Jesus would be forever like Melchizedek. It just means he's going to be our priest king forever. He's going to be after that same order, after that same example. So that's what that means. <clears throat> For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and pleased him, or blessed him, rather. Um, I've got a mark in my Bible. I couldn't read that. Um, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation, king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Salem means peace. So what he's saying is he was a righteous king, and he was a king of peace. He, uh, he led from a position of strength. He was not a vicious and violent person. So that's all that means. And he was a picture and a type of Christ that would come. Verse 3, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now, this is where you run into trouble. People read that and say, well, it had to be a pre-incarnate Christ. Well, if that was a pre-incarnate Christ, then even if he didn't have a beginning or an end, um, well, what, he, he has still had to have a stop and a start because he wasn't still there when Jesus came along. I mean, and people would have found it extremely suspicious if he had just never died. So you have to look at what the text means here. Um, I, I don't believe that this was uh, a an angelic being that never had kids or never got married or never... Uh, had a beginning you say well wait a minute brother Chad the Bible says that I know that I do but and, and I look I could be wrong but here's what I think it means if you turn back to Genesis and uh, just recall that it was a practice when speaking of men in the Bible to talk about their descendants or talk about their their where they came from um, in almost all cases in the Old Testament especially in Genesis when it would mention somebody it would tell you who they were a son of or it would tell you who they were uh, related to in some form or fashion, you see that. You don't see that with Melchizedek. So just by, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Just by the way that he's presented without being given any details about him, it could lead the folks, uh, let's say the Jews, 
who uh, this the Old Testament was was written by. <coughs> they believe uh, they believe because they weren't listed that they were non-existent, but that doesn't mean he didn't have any. It just means that there's none that we know of. Let let me just show you the passage, Genesis. Uh, 14, I think. Yeah, Genesis 14. Um, around verse, well, we'll start at verse 17. The king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer and of the kings which were with him at the valley of Shavay, which is the king's dale. Um, this is after Abraham went and rescued Lot and rescued all the prisoners and took back all the, the, the items that were stolen. You have to remember five kings banded together and attacked and took all of these things and Abraham took his men and went and saved them all. And so he's back and verse 18 says Melchizedek, the uh, king of Salem, and this is the first mention we have of him, says he's the king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. There's an interesting picture there of the bread and the wine. But uh, upon closer study, um, we're told that that was an, a normal meal in those days and it may not necessarily mean anything, but it's just interesting. Nowhere in the New Testament does the Lord's Supper call the drink wine. It's always called the cup. The cup, the cup, the cup. It's never called wine. So the only other place that you could try to apply that would be the Passover, and the Passover doesn't call it wine. See, a lot of people make a lot of mistakes. They, they assume a lot, and, and I'm already, wow, we're already 12 minutes in. <clears throat> I'm not going to get anywhere today. Anyway, the bread and wine don't necessarily mean anything. It just means he brought a meal, and he was the priest of the Most High God, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the most high God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave them tithes of all. Um, anyway, and then it goes on back to talking about Sodom. It never says anything else about him there. You don't see Melchizedek again there anywhere. Now, I don't believe this was a, a man who had no end, because then he'd still be here in the New Testament. So that doesn't make sense. Um, but... Hebrews 7 3 does say without father without mother without descent having neither beginning of days nor end of life but made like unto the son of God see it doesn't say he is the son of God it says made like him that's where I have an issue with this being pre-incarnate Christ if this was and there are plenty of them in the Old Testament where he does appear um, like in, in, in Daniel 3 and 25 and several other places like in Joshua but I don't think this is one. Um, he's just a, a picture and a type. And I think the picture and the type is based on him being a king and a priest. But we still have to address this. Without father could mean without father listed that we know of. Without mother listed that we know of. Without descent listed that we know of. There's no other information given about him. We, we just don't know. doesn't mean he didn't have those things. It means we don't know about him. But there's a picture there um, that Jesus who doesn't have father and mother because he's God. The picture is made about Christ, not about Melchizedek. That's my opinion, and we're going to move on. Anyway, um, nor, uh, beginning of days, nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. We know he was a great man. He was greater than Abraham. That's why Abraham gave him a tithe instead of him giving Abraham a tithe. So we agree on that. He was greater than Abraham. That much we agree on. <coughs> We're going to stop there because that's as far as I'm going to be able to get without getting into another section and point. But look, um, there's as far as Melchizedek goes, there's just a lot we don't know. It's, it's either one of two things. Either A, he was a real man who was the king of Salem, who was a priest and a king and a good king, and who loved the Lord and served the Lord much like Enoch did. And while he was alive, and, and you may say, well, then why isn't there more about him? Why didn't he, you know, there's not a lot about Enoch either. 
Um, you may say, well, why is Abraham such a central focus? Because Abraham received the promise of God and God had his reasons. Doesn't mean there weren't other good men that loved the Lord in those days. So either A, he's a man and a good one, and one that was uh, greater than Abraham at that time, or B, he is a pre-incarnate form of Christ, which makes even less sense because we don't know why he would be there all of a sudden and then disappear and how long he stuck around. Stuck around. So it doesn't matter. The, the point that we're supposed to get out of this is the Bible mentions nothing but good things about Melchizedek and the fact that he is the king of peace. He's the uh, priest of the Most High God. He is the priest king. All of these things are pictures of Christ and who he would be and who he will, uh, who he is. Um, he's going to be our king and our priest forever and ever and ever. <coughs> and that's, uh, that, that's really the point. All right, well, I'm interested in any thoughts you may have on this. If you've got an insight I don't have, just drop a, a comment in the comments below. Uh, let me know what you think or, uh, or not. <laughs> but glad to have you along. God bless you. Have a good day.